victory and you see men entering the religion of Allah in companies, then celebrate the praise of your Lord and ask his forgiveness. Surely he is oft returning to mercy. Sadaqallahu al-aliyul azim wa ma alayna illa al-balaghu al-mabeen. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. عن جابر ابن عبد الله الأنصاري عن فاطمة الزهراء عليه السلام بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله قال سمعت فاطمة أنها قالت دخل علي بي رسول الله في بعض الأيام فقال السلام عليك يا فاطمة فقلت عليك السلام قال إني أجد في بدني الوفاء فقلت له عيزك بالله يا بتاه من الضوف فقال يا فاطمة إتيني بالكساء اليماني فغطيني به فأتيته بالكساء اليماني فغطيته به وصرت أنظر إليه وإذا وجهه يتلألأ كأنه البدر في لينة تماميه وكماله صلوات الله مسؤول على محمد وعلى محمد فما كانت إلا ساعة وزا بولد الحسن عليه السلام قد أكبر وقال السلام عليك يا أمة فقلت عليك السلام يا قرة عيني وسمرة فوادي فقال يا أمه إن يشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله فقلت نعم إن جدك تحت الكساء فأقبل الحسن عليه السلام نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جدا يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أدخل معك تحت الكساء قال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا صاحب حوضي قد أزنت لك فدخل معه تحت الكساء صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد فما كانت إلا ساعة وزا بولد الحسين عليه السلام قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمة فقلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عيني وسمرة فوادي فقال لي يا أمة وإني شم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله فقلت نعم إن جدك وخاك تحت الكساء فدنا الحسين عليه السلام نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جدا السلام عليك يا من اختاره الله أتأذن لي أن أدخل معكما تحت الكساء فقال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا شافع أمتي قد أزنت لك 
فدخل معهم تحت الكساء صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد فانقبل عن ذلك ابن حسن علي بن ابي طالب عليه السلام وقال السلام عليك يا بنت رسول الله فقلت عليك السلام يا بل حسن ويا امير المؤمنين فقال يا فاطمة إني يشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة أخي وابن عمي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله فقلت نعم ها هو مع ولديك تحت الكساء فأقبل علي عليه السلام نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله أتعذنوا لي أن نكون معكم تحت الكساء قال له عليك السلام يا أخي ويا وصي وخليفة وصاحب لواي قد زنت لك فدخل علي عليه السلام تحت الكساء صلوات الله مسؤول على محمد وآل محمد ثم أتيت نحو الكساء وقلت السلام عليك يا أبتاه يا رسول الله أتعذن لي أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء قال عليك السلام يا بنتي ويا بضغتي قد أزنت لك فدخلت تحت الكساء صلوات الله صل على محمد وآل محمد فَلَمَّا اكْتَمَلْنَا جَمِيعًا تَحْتَ الْكِسَاءِ أَخَذَ أَبِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ بِطَرْفِ الْكِسَاءِ وَأَوْمَأَ بِيَدِهِ الْيُمْنَى إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَقَالَ اللَّهُمَّ إِنَّهَا أُولَاءِ يَهْنُ بَيْتِي وَخَاصَّتِي وَحَامَّتِي لَحْمَهُمْ لَحْمِي وَدَمَهُمْ دَمِي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم وسلم لمن سالمهم وعدو لمن عاداهم ومحب لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فاجعل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورضوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعن محمد فقال الله عز وجل يا ملائكتي ويا سكان سماواتي إني ما خلقت سماء مبنية ولا أرض مدحية ولا قمر منيرا ولا شمسا مغيا ولا فلكا يدور ولا بحر يجري ولا فلكا يسري إنا في محبة هؤلاء الخمسة الذين هم تحت الكساء فقال نمين جبرائيل يا رب ومن تحت الكساء فقال عز وجل هم أهل بيت النبوة ومعدن الرسالة هم فاطمة وأبوها وبعنها وبنوها اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد فقال جبرائيل يا رب أتعذن لي أن أهبط إلى الأرض ليكون معهم سادسا فقال الله نعم قد أزنت لك فهبت لمين جبرائيل وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله العلي الأعلى يقرأك السلام ويخصك بالتحية والإكرام ويقول لك وعزتي وجلالي إني ما خلقت سماء مبنية ولا أرض مدحية ولا قمر منيرا ولا شمسا مضيا 
ولا فلك يدور ولا بحر يجري ولا فلك يسري إنا لأجلكم محبتكم وقنزنا لي أن ندخل معكم فهل تأذنوا لي يا رسول الله فقال رسول الله وعليك السلام يا من وحي لا إنه نعم قد أذنت لك فدخل جبرائيل معنا تحت الكساء صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله فقال النبي ان الله قد اوحى اليكم يقول بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم انما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس ان البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وقال علي عليه السلام لأبي يا رسول الله أخبرني ما لجلوسنا هذا تحت الكساء من الفضل عند الله فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وآله هو الذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واصطفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا إلا ونزلت عليهم الرحمة وحفت بهم الملائكة واستغفرت لهم إلى أن يتفرقوا وقال علي عليه السلام إذا والله فزنا وفاز شيعتنا ورب الكعبة وقال النبي ثانيا يا علي والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا هو اصطفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في مفر من محافل أحن الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا وفيه مأموما إلا وفرج الله همه يا الله ولا مغموم إلا وكشف الله غمه يا الله ولا طالب حاجة إلا وقص الله حاجته يا الله فقال علي عليه السلام لزم الله فزنا وصعدنا وكذلك شيعتنا فازوا وصعدوا في الدنيا والآخرة ورب الكعبة اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العز نجل الأكرم وبحق حبيبك محمد وأنت المحمود وبحق علي وأنت الأعلى وبحق فاطمة وأنت فاطر السماوات والأرض وبحق الحسن وأنت المحسن وبحق الحسين وأنت قديم الإحسان وبحق عمة التسة الطاهرين من ذرية الحسين عليه السلام برحمتك يا أرحم الراهمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Salawat. When I shout, Ya Hussein, when I cry, Ya Hussein, when I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, when I shout, Ya Hussein, when I cry, Ya Hussein, when I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, every day Ashura, every land Karbala, 
Every word that we say, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. When I shout, Ya Hussein. When I cry, Ya Hussein. When I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. When we lift up your flag, we remember your name. When the world all is one, calls to you, O Hussein. We will stand by your side as we know you're our guide. We will stand by your side as we know you're our guide. In our hearts you remain, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. When I shout, Ya Hussein, when I cry, Ya Hussein, when I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. When Muharram arrives and our tears start to flow, and the love in our hearts for Hussein only grows. We will raise our arms, we will send our salams. We will raise our arms, we will send our salams. Every tenth we will cry, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. When I shout, Ya Hussein, when I cry, Ya Hussein, when I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. As we walk to your shrine, in our minds we reflect how you fought for Islam, we will never forget. But today you're alive, and your message will thrive. But today you're alive, and your message will thrive. Running through our veins, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. When I shout, Ya Hussein, when I cry, Ya Hussein, when I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, they will never destroy, they will never erase all the love that we have for our Master Hussein. Every night, every day, every place, everywhere. Every night, every day, every place, everywhere, we will echo the cry of Labaik, Ya Hussein. When I shout, Ya Hussein, when I cry, Ya Hussein, when I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, we will never submit to the likes of Yazid. They have martyred Hussein, but we are his seed. We will show them the way we will never betray. We will show them the way we will never betray. Our blessed Imam, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. All together. When I shout, Ya Hussein, cry, Ya Hussein. When I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. So today we await the Imam of our time, who will bring peace on earth to the whole of mankind. Ala jal ya Imam, ya Imam in zaman. Ala jal ya Imam, ya Imam in zaman. We will follow your cry of Labaik, Ya Hussein. When I shout, Ya Hussein. When I cry, Ya Hussein. When I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. When I shout, Ya Hussein. When I cry, Ya Hussein. When I shed all my tears, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. Salawat. Salawat.
This is an English poem titled The Hero of Karbala. Many, many years ago, on the bloody field of Karbala, a noble hero faced his foe as champion of God's faith and law. Overhead there was a scorching sun, there were no shady trees, beneath a burning sandy plain with no refreshing breeze. A scion of Hashem's noble line, of heroism, a model, son of Ali, the Lion of God, grandson of God's apostle. His comrades few but loyal and brave, some young and some advanced in age, the record of whose actions gave to history its brightest page. Of worldly comforts they had none, no couch nor rosy bed, to comfort their afflicted hearts, the holy word of God they read. Three days they every distress bore, deprived of drink and water. The world does still wonder at their unexampled fortitude. They fell around him one by one, firm. They fell around him one by one, firm in their righteous ways, and for their loyalty have won from friend and foe a world of praise. His friends with loving grief he eyed, lying dead in sun scorching rays. To justify his aim he tried to deal with foes in peaceful ways. He brought in arms his baby son, asked them to give him water. Said he, the babe no harm has done, to die of thirst or slaughter. Stones they threw and arrows shot, obedient to Yazid's behest and in their fury spared not even life of baby at the breast. A little before his enemies were for water sorely passed, relief he gave them then and there, and could not see even foes distressed. He humbly prayed and praised the Lord, the giver of spiritual beauty, and though midst danger never failed to do his sacred duty. Wickedness can no further go, cruelty needs no, fur no greater proof. His sacred body after death was trampled under horses' hoofs. Victory, though mean they gained, but still no bounds knew their ire. Orphans and widows they captives made and set their tents on fire. The captives saw with choking grief and eyes dimmed with tears. The tragic sight of martyrs' heads uplifted on spears. Salwat. Uh, there is a second English poem titled The Choice, and it is a lesson that we can all learn from Hazrat Hur. When I hear his story, it makes me think. When I'm drowning in sins, feeling I'm going to sink. I remember how he turned a new leaf. All you need is strength and also belief. When at school, I have a choice between making friends happy or sad. It gives me hope when I hear how he was torn between good and bad. He can al you can always turn guilt into something good. The Ahl Bayt will always shield us like a hood. When I hear about this awesome man, it makes me think I always can. When I'm on the crossroads, always trying my best, the story of this hero helps me with this test. When I hear how Hor changed his side, it must have been hard, but he had to decide. He surrendered to our Imam, hence tied behind his back. His story gives us hope to stay on the right track. So on. Salvat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi rahman ar-rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Tonight is the seventh uh, majalis in the Muharram series of majalis here at Masjid Ali alayhi salam. Uh, as you know, every night we have sponsors. The sponsors for tonight's program are the families of Dr. Asad Sadiq, Mr. and, Mu Mr. and Mrs. Muslim Hassam, Mr. Shabir and Dr. Rafia Khaku, Mr. Yasser Rizvi and Mrs. Samira Akhlaq, Mr. Safar and Mrs. Seher Sanogo, Sanya Zahra Ali, Mr. Hassan and Mrs. Narjus Mujlaba, 
Dr. Dr. Anwar Al Hadawi and family, Mr. Sohail and Mrs. Hina Nakfi, Mr. Aziz and Mrs. Ruhi Rizvi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept their amal in this holy month of Muharram. Let us recite a surah al Fatiha for their marhumin, your marhumin, and the marhumin of all mu'mineen and mu'minat. Fatiha. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In these holy nights of Muharram, let us also remember those who are in need for du'as, for their health, safety, protection, in all areas of the world. Let us specifically keep those in mind who are commemorating Muharram in areas that are difficult or dangerous to do so. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them protection. Let us recite verse 62 of Surah al namu together five times. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amman yujibul mudhtar idha da'ahu yakshifu su. Amman yujibul mudhtar idha da'ahu yakshifu su. Amman yujibul mudhtar idha da'ahu yakshifu su. Amman yujibu mudhtar idha da'ahu yakshifu su. Amman yujibu mudhtar idha da'ahu yakshifu su. Wa yaj'alakum khulafa al-lard. A'ilahumma Allah. Kalilam ma tadakkaroon. Salat. As you're already familiar, every night's majlis is sponsored. We're looking for sponsors, inshallah, every night, but specifically for the night of August 9th, which is the day after Ashura. If you're interested in sponsoring, you can speak with uh, Dr. Azim Hussain, Brother Sherry R. Heather, or myself. Uh, there's a very easy process. You can contact any one of us, and we'll help you uh, walk through it. And even if you ca uh, can't pay the full amount, even a small amount is OK. And we'd really much appreciate it. Uh, just a reminder for uh, men and women, in order to give our volunteers the opportunity to pray Salat in Jamaat, uh, please wait until after Salat to take your Tabaruk. Uh, we'll have stations outside the doors in men and women, and uh, inshallah you can pick up your Tabaruk after Salat so our volunteers can pray in Jamaat. As you've been hearing, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, we have two schools associated with Masjid Ali, Sadiq School, a full-time school, and Jafriya School, a Sunday school. For more information, you can check out those websites, or you can go to the table out front. Also, just some community events to keep in mind. Um, on Saturday, after Salat al-Maghribayn, we will be having a youth question and answer session with our respected guest speaker, Dr. Saeed Mustafa Al-Kazwini. This session will only be for youth aged 15 to 22, so high school and college youth. Please attend and please make sure to take advantage of this time is for our youth especially. I'm telling you, this will be a session that you will really benefit from. On Sunday, inshallah, there's going to be the Muharram Procession Jalus in New York City. And on Tuesday, August 9th, which is again the 11th of Muharram, instead of a majlis, we're going to have a community-wide Q&A with our respected guest speaker, Dr. Saeed Mustafa Al-Kazwini. And so please make sure you can attend that as well. Um, just a, a couple other uh, reminders uh, that uh, Saeed uh, requested that we talk about is uh, he has two great books out right now that are really great in helping you understand your faith. One of them is this one, Shia Islam. It really helps you understand the details and the, um, the details and the intricacies of our faith. And it will easily be able to help you answer any questions that you are asked. And if there are any questions you have about the faith, it will easily be answered. There's also another book out right now, his latest book, Monotheism, The Identity of God. This book uh, is specifically talking about Islam, the message of Islam, and truly understanding the, the basics of the religion. Both books are available on Amazon and at the Masjid Ali Library. It is now my honor
to invite our respected guest speaker, Hujat al-Islam, Dr. Sayyid Mustafa al-Qazwini, to the podium to address tonight's gathering. Please welcome him with the loudest of your salat. And please, everyone, please take two steps forward to the, uh, to the podium. Salat. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب صدق الله العلي العظيم There is a worldwide movement to promote atheism and agnosticism among the young generation. Many people ask, old, young, where is God in my life? Why I do not feel the presence of God in my life? Why does God does not reach out to me? In other tradition, in other faith traditions, if you go to a temple, you can see the picture of God, the statue of God. In some traditions, they touch, physically touch their deities, their lords. Why we don't see our God? Why I don't feel him in my life? These are legitimate questions, not necessarily asked by an atheist or agnostic. A Muslim can ask, a believer can ask, someone in your family may ask, your son, your daughter, they might ask these questions. These questions are legitimate, nothing wrong with them. They want to find out how they can reach out to God. How can they feel him? They feel God in their mind, in their life, in their hearts. So what are the ways? What are the answers? What do we do? Where do we go? What are the steps taken that I really feel the presence of God in my heart? I really can be able to communicate him. And I feel that he listens to me. He responds to me. Otherwise, the faith will be shaky. When we speak about God and monotheism, my friends, Tawheed is the essence of our faith. 99% of our faith is, is based on monotheism, Tawheed. So if we can fix this problem, the problem of God in our life, the presence of God, the feeling we feel, Yes, there is God. I can feel him. I can communicate with him. If we can solve this problem, the rest are easy. The rest of the problems and issues are easy. Now, first and foremost, my friends, in order for us 
to have a relationship with someone or something, we have to work for it. We have to endeavor. We have to struggle to get to that place, to get to that person. These things do not happen accidentally. When you want to establish a relationship with any person, even with your parents who are close to you, you need to do something. You need to be proactive. Otherwise, these relationships do not take place by themselves or automatically or by nature. You have to advocate for them. You have to search for them. You have to struggle for them. You have to give for these relationships. You have to initiate them. A relationship with God requires three things. In order for us to feel God in our life, to touch God with our hearts, not with our hands, with our hearts, with our minds, with our inner conscience, we require three fundamental things. Number one, we need to be honest with God. Honesty and sincerity. In the Islamic terminology, we call it ikhlas, the element of ikhlas, earnestness. Today, if you ask people, what do you like the most in your friend? If you want to establish a relationship with someone, a friendship with someone, what do you like the most in that person? What would the answer be? Sorry? Yes. Yes, exactly. The answer is going to be honesty. I want that person to be honest. I don't want to deal with someone who is dishonest. I don't want to deal with someone who is fake, who is a liar. You never know when he says the right and when he says the wrong. You need to deal with someone who is honest. When someone is honest, you have peace of mind. You know this person is genuine. He's not cheating. He's not lying. He's not a counterfeit. Honesty is important in life. And therefore with God we have to be honest too. God is honest with us. The promises that he gives, the gifts that he sends, he's honest. But we also have to reciprocate with God. It's not enough for the God to be a, a good God. It's not enough. It requires we to be good too, to reciprocate with that good God. If God is only good and I'm not good, I'm not going to benefit from him. I'm not going to feel him in my life. I have to reciprocate with him. When it comes, when it comes to a relationship with my Lord, First and foremost, we have to be honest. Sometimes in this life, we can spend some time, we can have friends, family members, we can be dishonest with them. We can cheat, we can lie, we can pretend that we love them, but in fact we do not, we do not love them. Okay? But when it comes to God, God is different. Sometimes we can get away with a relationship, a human relationship. Some people live as a husband and wife for many years, but one of them is dishonest. He's not telling his partner or her partner the truth. And they can get away with it. But later on, they will be discovered. Imam Ali salam says you cannot cheat. He says you cannot cheat for a long time. You cannot mislead or a trick or deceive people for a long time. You can. You may do for a short period of time, but not for a long period of time. Because it will appear on your tongue, on your face, on your gesture, on your movement. It will appear. People would realize. At the end, they will realize that this person is not honest. It takes some time. But with God, we cannot trick God. We cannot deceive God. God knows about us. God says, He knows you the best. Nobody knows us better than God. 
هو أعلم بكم إذ أنشأكم من الأرض He created you from this earth وأنتم أجنة You are fetuses in your mother's wombs Before you came into this life God knows everything about you He knows you best God says يعلم خائنة الأعين وما تخفي الصدور Whatever the heart conceals You cannot read my heart, neither I can read your heart. We can't read each other's hearts, but God does. This is his job. وَمَا تُخْفِ الصُّدُورِ Whatever we conceal in our inner conscience, in our heart, he can read. يَعْلَمْ He knows exactly what goes in your mind. He knows exactly about your intentions. With God, you cannot cheat. The other verse in the Quran says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ It is us who created man. It is us who know what his soul whispers to him. تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ And verily we are closer to him than his jugular vein. So with God we have to be honest. When we speak with God, when you pray, when you have a conversation with God, if you want to feel His presence in your life, number one condition, you have to be honest with God. My friends, all these events throughout the year, religious events, such as the month of Ramadan, the nights of Qadr, destiny, the night of Mid Sha'ban, these holy nights of Muharram, Thursday night, which is tonight, all these holy nights, even when you go to Hajj, the day of Arafat and Hajj, when you stand in the desert of Arafat and Hajj, are, all are intended for one thing, one thing, and that thing is to confess your sin to your Lord, to admit. To plead guilty, to tell him exactly what you did. The name Arafat comes from i'tiraf, confession. In Islam, we do not confess to our partners, to our friends, to our children. We don't, because we need to protect our honor and dignity. We do not confess to a maulana or sheikh or sayyid or a priest or monk or rabbi. We don't. We confess to someone who is a protective of us. He's very confidential. He doesn't share. He doesn't share what you confess to him with anyone. One of the characters of God, Ghaffaru al-Dhunub, Sattaru al is not only forgiving of sins, but he also conceals your faults, your mistakes, your errors, your poor choices. He does not share them with anyone. The hadith says, at the time of death, when we die, God is going to send us a message when we are dead. When people are gathered around our janazah for the janazah prayers that you see here almost every day in the cemetery for our funeral, God is going to send us a message. The message says, Abdi, laqad satartu alayka dhunuban. لو علم بها أهل الأرض لما وروك. My servant, do you know how many times I protected you? I did not expose you. I protected your honor and your dignity. I did not share this classified information about you, what you did, the great sins, the grave sins that you committed, the shameful acts that you committed. I kept them secret. I did not share them. If I had revealed them to people, nobody will participate in your janazah. They will abandon you. They would leave you without burial. Without burial. But out of mercy and love, merciful Lord, I protected you. I protected you. In the dua, we sometimes recite in the qunood, Ya man adhar al jameel wa satar al qabih. Oh my Lord, loving Lord, who always, who always outshine, who always 
who always bring about, bring about the good side of me and he hides the ba bad side of me, the qabih, the ugly. He does not expose me. He doesn't expose me. This is the character of God, always. So we have to be honest with God. God loves a person who speaks with him with honesty. When you confess, confess everything you did in silence. You don't have to share it with anyone. God knows. Sometimes you don't open your mouth. It goes in your in mind, in, in your mind, in your heart. God knows. But be honest with him. When you commit a sin, don't tell him, God, I did not commit that sin. When you did something knowingly, something wrong, knowingly, don't say, God, I did not know. Don't lie. If you don't lie with God, if you are honest with God, if you are very open with God, if you share every feeling you have with God, you will feel His presence in your heart. You will feel God in your heart. You will get close to God. This is one of the conditions. The first crime took place on earth thousands of years ago when Cain murdered Abel. Qabil murdered Habil. Why? Because one of them was sincere, the other was not sincere. One of them was honest, the other was not honest with God. God asked both of them. God said, I need an offering. Give me a donation. Give me a donation. He was testing them. God does not need our donations. He doesn't need our money. He is the source of wealth. But he was testing them. A test for mankind. Give me an offering. Habil went to the best of his products. And he presented it to God. Habil went to the worst product that he has. The, 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 the food that was bad. Rotten. Rotten. He presented that to God. As some people do today in this life. Some people, when they give to an Islamic cause, they don't give what is good. Something old, shabby, you know, out of order, broken. This is exactly what Qabil did. He was not honest with God, thinking that God does not distinguish, does not understand. God says, فَتُقُبِّلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمَا We accepted the offering of Habil. وَلَمْ يُتَقَبَّلْ مِنَ الْآخَرِ We rejected the, offer, the offering of Qabil because we know Habil was honest and that one was dishonest. Why Imam Hussein was victorious? There are many revolutions throughout the history of mankind and history of Islam. Why this revolution is specifically the day of Ashura, the revolution of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, is being celebrated every year. Why? Because Imam Hussein was honest with God. That is the secret. He had ikhlas, earnestness, dedication. Imam Hussein told his followers in the beginning, I'm not going to Kufa to assume leadership. I'm not aspiring to be a caliph, a leader. I am going to there, going to the land of Karbala to give my life and my blood. فَمَنْ قَبَلْنِي بِقَبُولٍ حَسَنٍ Whoever wants to join, God is welcoming him. There is no ministry, there is no leadership, there is no post, there is no... If you want martyrdom, this is the, right, the path of martyrdom. He was very open, very transparent, very honest with his followers from day one. He never cheated. Usually politicians, politicians when they run for elections, they give the promises. They are very generous in their promises, very generous. They turn America, Europe into a garden of paradise, but only during the election season. Once they are in the office, it's the old business again. Nothing is changing. They give false promises. Why? Because they want to get to the seat. Their goal is to get to the seat. They don't care about people. Ahlul Bayt, and Imam Hussein alayhi salam is different. Imam Hussein 
was showing them to the truth is the embodiment of sincerity and honesty he would not cheat he would not give false promises he had a class when you have a class you feel every step of his way he had a class he was sincere every step of the way until the moment of martyrdom one of our scholars my friends wrote a book the book is called Manazil al Akhira. This book has been translated to many languages. I think to Urdu, to Farsi, to English. The Stages of Akhira. Very interesting book. Very important book. What we are going to experience after death. There is a, another world. Very vague. Very ambiguous. We are going to experience. He writes it down in his book. These are the stations after the moment of death. This is the path we're going to go through. This is the procedure. This is what we're going to see. This is what we're going to hear. Manazil al-Akhirah. Very interesting book. That book was being read by a Mawlana, an Imam of a mosque, between the Dhuhr and Asr prayers. Between Dhuhr and Asr prayers, that Imam of that mosque would stand and open this book, Manazil al Akhira, and he reads some passages for the people who are sitting there. Among those who were in the audience was the father of this author of the book. His father was sitting there, and he would listen tentatively, he would enjoy. Then he goes home and he tells his son, he says, son, you know, the imam of our mosque, he's reading from a brilliant book, beautiful book. I wish you can write such a book. And the son never told his father, Papa, this is me. This is my book. Never, ever. Why? Because he had ikhlas. He wrote it for the sake of God. He did not write it for the sake of fame. He didn't write this book to be a celebrity, to brag about it. Every single day a father comes home and says, I'm enjoying this book which is being read. I wish you can write something like that. And the son never ever tells his father that I am the author of the book. Until the father died, he never knew that his son is the author. That man is buried next to the shrine of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wassalam. That man's name is Shaykh Abbas al-Qummi, someone who compiled the book of Mafatih al-Jinan, book of supplication. There are hundreds of books of supplications are written, but Mafatih al-Jinan is the bestseller. The bestseller. It's in every house, every mu'min house, every believing house, they have a copy of that book. Because he was humble, but God raised his ranks. God made him popular. God made him a celebrity. This is because of ikhlas. So when your relationship with your Lord based on honesty, you don't lie with God. You get, tell him everything, whether you did good or bad. Even if you commit a shameful act, come to him in the middle of the night. Share it with your Lord. Say, God, I'm a human being. God, I was overcome with my weakness. I am weak. But I promise you, I would not do such and such and such. Speak about it in details. Be honest with God. Be open with God. God loves your honesty. This is how you feel his presence. So this is number one, ikhlas. The element of ikhlas. The more you have ikhlas and earnestness in your life, the closer you get to God. Friends, I've been here among you for five or six nights. I made good friendships with many of you. Not because we do business. We don't have any business together. But because I see in many of you the element of ikhlas and sincerity. And I fall in love with sincerity. I don't ask about people's Career, profession, even names. I don't know many names. I do not know their names. But what I know about them, they have ikhlas. 
I fall in love with that quality of ikhlas. This is how we feel the presence of God. When you, the more ikhlas you have, the more you feel Him in your life. This is number one. Number two, the second element of trust. Trust is the cornerstone of every relationship in this life. Likewise, it is the cornerstone of our relationship with the divine, with God. You know, on our $1 bill in America, what do you read? In God, we trust. But I wonder how many people mean it really. You know, they just write it on the dollar bill. Do they really mean it in God they trust? I don't know. I hope so. Trust is important in every relationship, whether it is marriage, whether it is business, whether it is a friendship, whether you are traveling with someone, working with someone, you have to build the trust. Sometimes people do not sign documents, no signatures, no contracts, no papers. They give their words and their words are more powerful than their signatures and their contracts. They don't back up. When they give their word, his signature is what? Is his character. Is his character. When he promises something, when he says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to stand there, I'm going to be there, they say one of the prophets of God made an appointment with someone in his community that we're going to meet tomorrow under this tree at you know, after sunrise. The prophet went there after sunrise, waiting for that guy to show up. The guy was busy. He forgot. He forgot his appointment with the prophet. The prophet did not come back home. His wife came to him. Why are you standing here? He said, but I have an appointment. She said, where is the appointment? What time is it? He said, after sunrise. She said, now it's sunset. He said, still, maybe that person would remember and come. For three days, for three days, after three days, all of a sudden that guy remembered, oh, I had an appointment with this prophet. Let me go and see if he's there. He comes and he finds him standing there. God said, this prophet is sadiq al-wa'ad. He's a true in his promise. He made a promise. Though that guy broke the promise, but he didn't. We make many promises with our wives, with our children, with our neighbors, with our community people, with our friends. How many of us honor these promises? How many? This is the essence of Iman. The essence of Iman is not just standing and bowing and prostrating five times a day. Though this is important, the essence of Iman, when you stand, when you live up to your promise that you made. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهْدِهِمْ رَعُونَ Because this builds trust. Why sometimes marriages are falling apart? Because they don't trust each other. When the trust is broken, the marriage is broken. I remember in one of the family counseling I did, which ended, ended in divorce, the wife would tell me that my husband, we did not trust each other. So when we filed for uh, taxes, you know, tax return, when I have to put my signature on the paper, the husband covers the numbers. He doesn't allow me to know his income. He covers, he says, you only sign here. He doesn't allow me to see the papers. This is her husband living with her for so many years and they have kids, but he does not allow his wife to read the numbers. Can you imagine? What sort of marriage is this? This is not marriage. And naturally it, it ended in divorce. Okay, we have to build the trust. If you want your marriage to move forward, your relationship with your friends, don't break the trust. Because once the trust is broken, there is no recovery. There is no recovery, sorry. People cannot trust you again. Same thing with God, my friends. We need to trust God. If you ask me, how do I feel God in my life, His presence, you must trust Him. If you don't trust Him, you would never feel His presence in your life. Because you are not trusting Him. 
We trust ordinary people. You trust the doctor when he prescribes med medicine for you, medication. Sometimes you don't like antibiotics, but the doctor says this is necessary for your health. If you want to recover, you must get this. So you submit to him because you trust his word. You trust the surgeon with your life in very complicated surgeries. You trust the airline and the pilot. You fly with him 17 hours over the ocean because you trust this airline. You trust the pilot. You trust an attorney. You assign him your case. You give him money. You trust him. Life is based on a trust. Why we don't trust God? We must trust God. When God, when God orders us that these things you must do, we call them wajibat. Do not miss on your prayers. Do not miss on your fasting. Do not miss on your zakat. Because you are not benefiting me, you are benefiting you, yourself. Trust him. When God says, Wala taqrabu zina, do not approach fornication. Do not approach ham or wine. It's not because it's going to hurt him. It's going to hurt me if I commit these things. We have to trust him. We have to trust the promises he made in the Quran. God says in the Quran, In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. Chapter 17, Surah Al-Isra. Wa in asa'tum falaha. If you do good to anyone in this life, you are doing good to your own self. And if you do evil to anyone in this life, you are doing evil to yourself first. One day Imam Ali alayhi salam said, I never sallu ala Muhammad wa He said, I never helped anyone in my life. They said, what? You dedicated your entire life into helping people, serving people, and you say, I never? He said, no, but read the Quran. Quran says if you help others, you are helping yourself. You are helping your own self. You are benefiting yourself. In ahsantum, when you do good, you are doing good to your own selves. And if you do bad and evil, you can't escape the consequences. You are doing bad and evil to your own self too. This is a promise. Promise, a true promise. We see it. Another promise in the Quran. We're going to read it tonight, inshallah, in Surah Al-Zilzila. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يرى. If you do an act of goodness, no matter how minute, microscopic, microscopic act, you will see the result in your life. It's not going to vanish. It's not going to go away. And if you do a microscopic act of evil against people, you will face the consequences too not going to go away. You can't get away. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَهُ These are the true promises. We have to trust God. We have to trust God when He gives us these promises. Once we trust Him and we act upon them, we will feel, we will feel His presence in our life. You will feel Him. You will feel the inspirations. God says, if you fear me, if you are with me, if you don't disobey me, I am going to give you the best GPS system in this life. The best navigation system in this life. That navigation system is going to lead you always, always, always to, to the straight path. Always in your journey in this life. You would never go wrong. You would never take the wrong exit. In Allah, this is a verse in the Quran. This is a true promise. Yaj'al lakum furqana. God is going to provide you with furqan. Furqan is GPS, navigation system. So you are not confused in your life. You know how many people are confused when they are about to make a decision about their life, their business, their health, their family, their residence, their traveling, their affairs. They are confused. Confused, uncertain. They don't know what to do. God says, if you fear me and you are with me and you don't commit a sin, you resist sin, I am going to send you a criterion, a GPS system, an inner vision. Even if visibility is zero, 
you can still follow the right path. You don't go wrong in your life. You are not going to make a wrong decision in your life. This is God's biggest gift for the reverence, for the believers. So trust God when he makes such decisions. Trust God. See, sometimes we call upon God, but we don't trust him. We say, Ya Allah, all of us, we say, Ya Allah, it's very easy. How many times a day we say, Ya Allah, but sometimes we don't pay attention to this sentence. We don't appreciate the meaning of it. I say, Ya Allah, but I know, you know, food is going to come to me. I know I have the best lawyer. I know I have the, I know the police chief in town. I know the, this lawyer. I know this physician. I know this surgeon. I know this merchant. But I say, Ya Allah, just... But in the back of mind, I have people who are supporting me. No, when you say, Ya Allah, cut yourself off from others. I'm not saying don't go to the doctor, don't go to the lawyer. No, but you have to say it firmly from the bottom of your life. You have to mean it. Many times we say, Ya Allah, but we don't mean it. They say someone, a Sufi, was trying to look for the best dua. So they told him, if you want the best dua, the most effective, the most powerful dua, go to such and such a place on the river in Africa. Someone lives there nearby a river. Go to him, knock at his door, and insist on him to give you the best dua. This dua creates miracles, miracles, when you read this dua. So he traveled. He said, it's worth it. I have many problems in my life. I need dua, strong dua. So he traveled to that person. He arrived into his house. He said to him, I want you to give me the best dua you have. I've been told that you know a very effective, very powerful, very magical supplication dua. So please teach me. And I am ready to give you money, to give you anything, to serve you. I said to him, okay, stay with, you, with me for a few days. I will give you. The following day he asked him, he said, be patient, I will. When the time comes, I will. The third day he asked him, he kept telling him, I will, I will. One day he said, when? When are you going to tell me? It's only dua. I said, okay. Before I teach you the dua, take this bucket, go to the river, fill it with water, and come back. And when you come back to me, I will teach you the dua. He said, that's it only? You need water? He said, yeah, that's it. Very simple. So he took the bucket with full force. He was running, happy, thrilled that he's going to learn the dua. It's very easy. Just go put the bucket inside the river, get the water and come out. When he reached the river, once he put the bucket, what happened? What happened? A river in Africa, what do you expect? A crocodile attacked him jumped out of the water at him. So the man spontaneously cried, Ya Allah, from the bottom of his heart. And he retreated. He was safe. Came back shaken to this sheikh, to the Sufi. The Sufi said to him, the sheikh said to him, what happened? Said, what happened? Are you crazy? You sent me to the river? There is crocodile. I almost died. He says, so what happened? Why did you die then? He said, because I, uh, I said something I don't know. He said, what did you say? He said, I said, Ya Allah. He said, this is the most powerful dua. He said, really? Ya Allah? But I say this every day. He says, yeah, you say it, but without intention. You say it without paying attention. Without meaning. You say it when you are relaxed. Now you said it seriously. It came from the bottom of your heart. This is an effective dua. Some people come and ask, Sayyid, do you have a dua? I say, you are reading dua every day, but put your mind with it. Put your heart with it. Put your mind. When you send the dua, send this distress signal. Distress signal. Amman yujibul muftar. The distressed. Send an SOS message. Send a message 
Like the message that today someone was drowning in the Atlantic, I read in the news, and he was 18 hours in the waters. He sent a distress message. They sent him the Coast Guard. They saved his life. These are the messages that you have to send. From the bottom, you have to mean it. You have to trust God. My friends, sometimes we pray to God. We, meet, we do dua, but we don't trust God. We trust the surgeon more. We trust the doctor. We trust the ambulance. We trust the lawyer more than we trust our Lord. So this is the second. The third, third element of feeling God in our life, intimate relationship with God. Is sacrifice. There is no love without sacrifice. We cannot claim that we love God, we have God in our life, if we are not willing to sacrifice. Life is based on sacrifice, whether it is marriage or business. See, some of you established businesses when you came to this country. See how many hours you put into that business, into that office. Sometimes 20 hours a day of hard work until you became a successful entrepreneur. You put 20 hours, some people 20 hours. I said the story today to some of friends. A Chinese man came to America. I read this story in the LA Times. Very amazing, very touching. He came penniless. He had only $5 with him. He came from a farm. His family are farmers in one of the remote areas in China. He came to this country, he landed at LAX with only $5. He did not own a bag, he didn't have a suitcase. He put some clothing in a plastic bag. When he disembarked from the airplane, plastic bag. And he worked in a bakery, he could not afford to pay rent, he slept in the same bakery. But he worked hard, he worked very hard. And he puts his trust in God. And he works hard. Today, my friends, after a few years, his business is worth $1 billion. Check out his story. The name of his business is AA Meat Product. AA Meat Product. $1 billion. He came with $5. Why? Because God says, I, I promise those who work hard, even if they are not religious, even if they do not believe in me, I will give them the opportunity because they are hardworking and sincere. This is a verse in chapter 17. God says, even those who do not believe in me, because they have sincerity and hardworking, I will make them successful in this life. <laughs> Both groups, we supply them from the treasures of God, from the blessings of God, the believers and the non-believers, and the non-believers too. And God would never withdraw his help from his mankind. In this life, he will give them. In the hereafter, it's a different story, different story. He has to have faith in God in the hereafter in order for him to succeed. But in this life, any person can be successful. God will give him as long as that person is sacrificing, sacrificing his life, his time. Therefore, religion requires sacrifice. Five daily prayers are not easy, especially Salatul Fajr. Many of us, we miss the prayers of Fajr. And God says the prayers of Fajr is more important than other four prayers. God says to the Prophet, Aqim as-salata li duluk shams at noon. And by the way, the prayers time, main timings are three. If they, you are asked, why do you pray three times a day? Tell them it's in this book in chapter 17, Surah Al-Isra. God says to the Prophet, when he mentions the main timing of the prayers are three, not five, three. Aqim al-Salat, establish the prayers. Li duluk al-Shams, duluk al-Shams when the sun is here above your head. That is the time of Dhuhr and Asr. First Dhuhr, followed by Asr. First noon, followed by afternoon. Ila ghasaq al-Layl, ghasaq is dusk now, almost now. 
This is the timing of two prayers. One time for two prayers. Maghrib, sunset, and Isha, the night prayers. And the third one, the third timing, Quran al-Fajr. See, he says the recitation, recite in Salatul Fajr, if you can recite long chapters of this book. Many of us, we want to wrap it up immediately. This is why many of us, after Surah Al-Hamd, we recite Qul Huwa Allah, and then we end it, and we leave. People are asking me, Sayyid, why do you recite other chapters? Why don't you recite Qul Huwa Allah? Qul Huwa Allah is important, but Qul Huwa Allah is not the entire Quran. We should not neglect other verses in the Quran. Teach yourself. Memorize other brief chapters in the Quran. Memorize them. Reflect. Quran in the prayers is for reflection. It's not for entertainment. It's to reflect on these verses. So God says, Salatul Fajr is important. Why? Wa Quran al Fajr. Inna Quran al Fajr. The, the, the morning prayers, the Fajr prayers, Kana Mashhuda, there is a special emphasis on it. It has been witnessed by the angels of the night and the angels of the day. Have you seen the exchange of the guard, the changing of the guard? Sometimes at some royal palaces, when one shift comes, the other goes. At Fajr, God says there is the shift of guards. So those angels, when they come, the angels of the night are leaving, they will witness your prayers, and the angels of the day are coming, they will witness your prayers. Witnessed by two groups of angels. Don't miss these prayers. Require some sacrifice. If you don't sacrifice, you cannot feel the presence of your God in your life. Hijab, I say to many of my honorable sisters, and I know many honorable sisters, they pray, they fast, they pay charity, they go to ziyara, but they still have a challenge with the hijab. And I pray, inshallah, God will enable them, empower them, strengthen them, inspire their hearts to cling to the hijab, to keep it. The banner of Islam, the banner of dignity. It's not easy. We have to admit, we are men, it's easy for us to speak about hijab, but for them, it's a different story, especially for the young ones in this country. Especially for the young ones, it's a huge challenge. But they can do it. They can do it. I know a judge in Dearborn, Michigan. She's a judge. She, she sits on the bench. She said, for so many years, I struggled with the idea of hijab. Should I wear or should I not? One day I said, Khalas, tomorrow I'm going to go to the courthouse with my hijab. And she went. And because she had the support of her husband, my friends. You guys are important, instrumental. If the mother, if the daughter of the wife does not have the support of her husband, her father, her brother, she cannot do it by herself. So this judge, she had the support of her husband. And she went there. And people freaked out. Who is she? Some of them said to her, do you have cancer? You lost your hair? What is this? She said, no, I have no cancer. I have God in my heart. I decided to get closer to God. This is what God wants me to do. She's a judge in America, in the heart of America. You can do it, my friends. Sisters, you can do hijab. You can practice hijab. Zakat, another aspect that some people don't care about. It's a big challenge to pay your zakat, to pay your dues. God says, whenever I mention in this book the prayers, the salat, immediately he mentions zakat after that. Why? Because he says, salat cannot take off by itself unless it is enhanced by zakat. Aqimu salat wa atu zakat. It's a challenge. It's a sacrifice. You need to give money. Making money in this country is not easy. This is your money, but God says, give it to me, I will return. I'll give you a better return. I'll save this money for you. Trust God when he says this. Trust God, my friends. Trust him. It's all about the trust. Once we trust God, we're going to feel his presence. Let me tell you a story that happened, and I conclude. A few weeks ago, 
in my community a lawyer recently graduating she got a very lucrative job offer in one of the most prestigious law firms in this country it has a branches here in New York in LA and other places with six figures salary after three weeks, she dropped out. I said, why did you drop out? Her salary is $120,000 a year. She said, yeah, I don't, ha I, I don't feel happy about it. Why? She said, because I feel I'm standing with these giant corporations against ordinary people, beleaguered people. She worked in an employment law firm. She said, I am siding with the giant corporations, with the billionaires, against people who are making ends meet, who are struggling. So I don't feel good about it. I feel this money is not halal, it's haram. I don't enjoy this money. I don't care about the salary. I care about my principles and my values. Subhanallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I admire that person. She is not a sellout. And God will give her a better job, a better opportunity. This means, this is the meaning of taqwa. My friends, taqwa does not mean we have to climb Mount Everest. No. Something doable. But we need a power of resistance. We need a stronger attachment to God. We need fear of God. We need to put God my priority. Not money. Not money. I, I, I shared her story with another lawyer. She said, subhanAllah, I had the same feeling in the beginning of my career. But when I, when I saw the checks coming, I didn't care. <laughs> See? Taqwa is important, my friends. Not anyone can live up to it. And it doesn't happen overnight. One of the things that going to deepen your taqwa is when you keep your heart, your stomach away from haram. When I say haram, there are two things that are haram. Number one, haram food, haram meat, haram drink. Alcohol is forbidden. non zabiha is forbidden. No matter how delicious, how good it, it smells. Stay away from it. You have to have a power of resistance. God says in his book, Surah Al-An'am, twice, not only one time, twice. وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا لَمْ يُذْكَرِ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ Stay away. From the meat where the name of God is not being rehearsed upon it during slaughtering, not during eating, during slaughtering. Stay away. He says twice. This is one type of haram. The other type is when the money is haram. The money where you purchase the food and the drink with it, it's not lawful. It's not lawful. It does not come from a lawful source. Lawful, lawful so source. This is against haram. Because you contaminate your heart. The Prophet says if one bite of haram goes into your stomach, one bite of haram, it will intercept the dua. It would not let your prayers and your dua to go up. Don't you read in the dua every single time when you pray? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min nafsin la tashba' wa min qalbin la yakhsha' wa min ilmin la yanfa' wa min salatin la turfa' wa min dua'in la yusma' I seek refuge in you from our prayers. I did the prayers for rak'ah, ruku', sujood, with wudu. It's not going up, not even to the ceiling of Masjid Ali, let alone the heaven. It doesn't go up. Why? Because the heart is contaminated. The heart is contaminated. وَمِن دُعَاءٍ لَا يسمع. I pray, I scream, I cry. God is not listening. Why? The heart is not clean. It's contaminated with sin. Especially with eating the haram. Eating haram is so dangerous, so detrimental. Keep your family away from it. These are the three things where we get closer to God. Ashab al Hussein, his companions, among them Al Qasim ibn al Hassan alayhi salatu was salam. You know, Qasim was 13 or 14. And 
His uncle Imam Hussein alayhi salam asks him the night of Ashura. He's testing him. He's saying to him, Bunaya Qasim, my sweetie Qasim, Kaifal Mautu Indik. How do you feel about death? He's testing him. The answer came. He didn't say, I'm nervous, my uncle, I'm really nervous, I'm worried. I'm worried about the battlefield. I've never been in a battlefield. This is my first time. He never said that. He said, Ammah, my honorable uncle. Fi nusratik, wallah, by the Lord, fi nusratika ahla min al-asl. In your support, in your defense, in defending my faith, my Quran, my religion, my principles, death to me is sweeter than honey. Sweeter than honey. These are the principles of Ashura. Because they kept their heart clean. They are not afraid of death. We are afraid of death. When we see a dead person, when we remember that death, we cannot sleep the night because we are not prepared. But for those who are prepared, they welcome death. He was enchanted by death. He had passion for Shahada. In fact, Imam Hussein kept them at bay. They pleaded to him. All of his ashab, all of his family members, they come and seek permission. He says, no, 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 no. This is what happened with Qasim alayhi salam. Qasim came the first time, the second time, the third time. He threw himself on Imam Hussein's feet. He was kissing the feet of his uncle. Imam Hussein would say, no, you are a trust with me. My brother Hassan alayhi salam gave you at the age of three or four, as a trust, wadi'ah. Wadi'ah means a trust. I cannot let you go. Of course, before, with Imam Hassan, with, with Qasim ibn al-Hassan, there were three others. So altogether, the children of Imam Hassan alayhi salam in Karbala were four. Three of them were martyred. One of them was wounded, al-Hassan al-Muthanna. He survived. His family took him to Medina. He became one of the greatest scholars and also his children, his offspring. Those who died in Karbala was Abdullah al-Akbar, Abdullah the senior, Abdullah al-Azghar, sorry, Abdullah the senior, and Abdullah the junior, al-Azghar. Those two, and al-Qasim. The second Abdullah the junior was the very last one to die, even after he died after Ali al-Azghar. Because when Imam Hussein fell in the battlefield, this boy was 11. He could not see his uncle being murdered. So he ran. Imam Hussein noticed him. He said, Ukhtah Zainab, Sister Zainab, prevent him. Don't allow him to come to the battlefield. She ran after him. She could not catch him. He went. He threw himself on Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein was lying on the floor. So when Shimr came to hit Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he stretched his hand. He said, are you going to kill my uncle? I would not let you. So the sword fell on his arm. His arm was severed. So he cried. Imam Hussein hugged him to his chest. While he was hugging him, another criminal shot an arrow into his heart, pierced into his heart and killed him at the age of 11. This is Abdullah al-Azghar, the son of Imam Hassan. So Qasim alayhi salam came to his uncle Hussein. Ammah, please let me go. He said, I would not be able to let you go. He sent, he went to his mother Ramla. He said, Imam does not give me permission. Ramla said, listen, my son Qasim, there is a letter on your arm, tied to your arm. Give it to me, I'll show you something. Take this letter to your uncle Hussein. So he took the letter from his arm. He gave it to Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein read in that letter, he read the writing of Imam Hassan to Qasim, saying, O oh Qasim, my son Qasim, إذا اشتدت عليك الأمور فعليك بنصرة عمك الحسين. When you go through time of distress, then the only solution for you is to stand and defend your uncle Hussein. He showed him the letter. When Imam Hussein read the letter and he saw the handwriting of his brother Hassan, he cried. And then he said, Eetuni bi'imamati ya akhi al-Hassan. 
bring me the turban of my brother Hassan. He put it on the head of Qasim. He hugged Qasim. They cried for a long time until he gave him permission. He took the sword. He went to the battlefield with sandals into the battlefield, reciting this poetry, Intun kiruni fa'ana najlul hasan. سبط النبي المصطفى والمؤتمن هذا الحسين كالأسير المرتهن بين أناس لا سقوا صوب المزن If you don't recognize me, I am the son of Imam Hassan. I am the grandson of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. My Imam is being beleaguered and I am determined to defend my faith and my principle and my Imam as he was fighting, engaged in fighting. His sandals snapped. So paying no attention to the army, he bent down to fix, to tie it up. When he bent down, Ya Mu'mineen, Ajarakum Allah, Inna Lillah wa Inna Ilayhi Raja'oon. One of the army of Bani Umayyah, an army combatant, he struck him on his head with the sword. Qasim fell down to the earth, crying, Ammah, Ammah, Aba Abdullah, alayka minni salam. My salam to you, O Hussein. I need your help. I need your assistance, O Hussein. Asra'a ilayhi al-Ibam al-Hussein. He rushed to him. He rushed towards him like a roaring lion. When the dust settled, it was seen, Imam Hussein was seen standing next to the head of the boy and saying, Ya Uzzu ala ammik an tad'u'ahu fala yujibuk aw yujibuk fala yu'inuk aw yu'inuk fala yugni ank bu'dan li qawmin qataluk ma ajra'ahum ala al-Rahman wa ala antihaak hurmat al-Rasul O Qasim, O my sweet Qasim it is with regret that I came to help you, but I could not help you. I could not save your life, but I ask Allah not to have mercy, not to bestow mercy on this army that is murdering you, and their adversary on the day of judgment is your grandfather Rasulullah and your father Hassan al-Mushtaba. And then Imam Hussein carried this boy, young boy of 13 or 14, while his legs were dragging on the floor, on the ground. You know why? Qasim was not very tall, but the back of Imam Hussein was bending. Imam Hussein, because of this tragedy, could not straighten his back. He was bending and he was carrying the body of Qasim until he brought him to the makeshift mortuary next to the other martyrs, next to Ali al-Akbar and other shuhada. His mother Ramla was there. She was too embarrassed to go. She was waiting for Hussein السلام, to leave the tent. Once Imam Hussein left the tent, she rushed to the body of her son Qasim. You know, every mother has two wishes in her life. One wish is to marry her son, is to enable him to get married, to witness his marriage. This is one wish. The other wish is when she dies, that son comes to her aid, stands with her, carry her coffin, go to the cemetery, bury the mother, Ramla, Lady Ramla, this is what she was telling her son Qasim. Qasim, I am helpless and hopeless. I had hope to see the wedding day, your wedding day. My other hope was to see you standing at my deathbed at the, at the time of my death to help me to carry my coffin, to carry me to, to my cemetery. Inna lillah. وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم على عز الأجل الأكرم يا الله O oh Allah bestow forgiveness on us bestow health inshallah and recovery on all those people who are asking us for du'as during these holy nights bestow fast recovery and full health on them ya arhamar rahimin remove this disease this affliction from mankind and hasten the return of our master and our leader al-imam al-hujjat ibn al-hasan al-mahdi al-muntadar for the soul of mu'mineen and mu'minat thawab al-fatiha ma'a salati ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad
शर्मा गई अब्बास न लौटे शहर आ गए मशका गई अब्बास न लौटे शहर आ गए मशका गई अब्बास न लौटे रोने के लिए लाशायशा बीर पे रन में रोने के लिए लाशायशा बीर पे रन में फिर दास से मा गई आपस न लौटे Can I have your attention, please? Um, will the owner of a blue Hyundai, New Jersey license plate E98NRH, kindly move your vehicle, your uh, block? Yeah. 